Um, it is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Nelly Lahut uh, to you. Um, actually, I have to say, I assume that most of you know her and that I don't have to introduce her really, but uh, still, I, I will, just for the record. Well, Nelly Lahut was so kind to um, agree to give a, a wrap-up of, of the whole conference, which is clearly an immense task to do. Um, she will do that with a, um, with her, from her own perspective and trying to give an outlook also to what is to expect it. Um, Nelly Lahoud uh, is Senior Fellow for Political Islamism at the International Institute for Strategic Studies Middle East. Um, she completed her PhD in 2002 at the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National Unity, uh, University. Sorry. Um, I think most of you will know her um, because she is the, or has been the lead author of the Letters from Abu Tabat, um, the report that analyzed the declassified documents captured in Osama bin Laden's compound. So um, we are very happy to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine, and I join the rest of the speakers in thanking Cass for organizing this event. I'm delighted to be part of this conference. I've learned a lot from the presentations and discussions, and needless to say, my wrap-up, as my session has been designated, will not do justice um, to the ideas that were discussed over the past couple of days. Um, I also want to commend the organizers for the theme of this conference. Not surprisingly, the provinces, or the wilayat of the Islamic State, are also on the mind of the leaders of IS. Indeed, in November 2016, and in the midst of the Battle of Mosul, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the Islamic State's leader, released a public statement in which he highlighted the relevance of the wilayat in the context of IS's ter territorial losses in Iraq and Syria. He wanted, and I'm quoting him, um, to remind our Muslim brethren that if the ways to perform the Hijra to the territories of Iraq and the Levant are constrained and the routes to get there are obstructed, God has provided for them a wider and accessible path to perform the Hijra, namely a path to the blessed Wilayat so that they may establish one of the abodes of Islam and thereby gain the meritorious reward reserved for those who establish a precedence, or a sabika, in defending God's religion and making his word reign supreme. End of quotation. Baghdadi's main concern in that statement, which is the last we heard from him to date, was to boost the morale of his fighters out of fear that they may flee the battlefield. But this specific reference to the wilayat suggests that while al-Baghdadi fears that the territories his group holds in Iraq and Syria may well be lost, he thinks that the provinces are the future of the caliphate. So using the conference organizer's language, what might be the future and potential impact of the provinces after the military defeat of IS in Syria and Iraq? I shall refrain from making predictions. I believe all the crystal balls are on loan. Um, but instead, my wrap up will build on the presentations during the past two days to cover the following themes. Firstly, what might IS's territorial losses mean for the group's ideological narrative? Second, what we know about IS's relations to its provinces and identify what we don't know. And third, consider whether there are lessons learned from Al Qaeda. Let me start with IS's territorial losses and their impact on the ideological narrative of the group. In April 2014, two months before the proclamation of the caliphate, when it was still called the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. Its spokesman, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, concluded a public statement with a mubahala for the Arabist, which means a public supplication that echoes an, a verse in the Quran. He besieged God to furnish his worshippers with proof concerning the group's legitimacy. Adnani implored God that if ISIL, is the true Islamic state, may God reward the group with victory against its enemies. And if it is not, he prayed that God should defeat it and kill its leaders. At that time, ISIL was on its ascent and on its path to capture Mosul and link its territories in Iraq with some of those that it had captured in Syria. 
When this happened, Adnani proclaimed the caliphate, the global Islamic state, in June 2014, claiming that the legitimacy of IS is promised on God's promise, echoing a Quranic verse in which God promises true believers tamkeen, territorial strength, that is, so that they may implement God's law. In November 2014, IS launched its Wilayat project to mark its global expansion. In this orchestrated effort, groups in Egypt, Algeria, Yemen, Libya, and Saudi Arabia pledged their bayat or their pledges of allegiance to the caliph on the same day. Three days later, Baghdadi accepted their bayat, bestowing upon the groups the title of provinces. And in time, the wilayat grew to span over 10 countries, as we've seen over the past couple of days. Although they proved unable to hold and govern territory except for small parts of Libya, all of the wilayat carried out military operations with varying degrees of success. Irrespective of the extent to which supporters and enemies of IS exaggerated the group's strength, the group's successes on the battlefield held what to some deed seemed to be like a divine promise. So was God really fighting on their side, perhaps? The seeming certitude of IS leaders about the destiny of their caliphate combined with the group's battlefield victories had a global appeal, and foreign fighters flocked to join the group. Yet the size of the global caliphate peaked before the group celebrated its first year anniversary, and its territories are shrinking by the day. Now, if capturing territory reflected God's promise of tamkeen as a reward for believers, what might losing territory mean? In what ended up being his adieu speech, Adnani crafted a narrative shift, assuring IS fighters that they would not be defeated, even if they were left to roam, and I'm quoting him, left to roam in the desert with no city and land. In this version of the narrative, defeat is not about losing territories. Rather, defeat comes when, and I'm quoting him, one loses the will and the desire to fight, and if, I, and if the US succeeds in removing the Quran from the hearts of Muslims. Now, will this shift in narrative be convincing? I share Mara Refkin's view concerning the negative impact of IS's territorial losses on the group. I don't believe that IS leaders are going to re recover the strength of their one-time ideological narrative. It's simple. Losing cannot be winning. IS was appealing to groups and individuals because IS was winning. Now it is losing. Adnani was killed in August 2016, and several other IS leaders have met the same fate, which caused some jihadis to question whether Adnani lost his mubahala, which I mentioned earlier. Indeed, if IS's change of fortune is assessed through a religious prism, one would likely conclude that IS is not, after all, the state that God promised in the Quran. Here, I think it's fitting to make some remarks about some of the points that were raised about ideology the past two days. Ideology is what I do for a living, and while I believe it is very important in understanding jihadi groups, I think we need to understand when ideology matters, how it matters, and very importantly, when it does not matter. I don't believe it's helpful to use general descriptions such as Salafism or Wahhabism. They offer very little by way of understanding jihadism. After all, jihadi groups ground their legitimacy in the Islamic creed, just as militant Christian and Jewish groups, militant, uh, groups ground their legitimacy in Christianity and Judaism. So the jihadis are not really re reinventing a new creed. They are using elements from the existing corpus of Islam. Instead, we need to identify, as political scientists, which ideological elements these groups emphasize to advance their agenda, which points they use to justify militancy, and so on and so forth. I very much share Florence Gobe's analysis about French jihadis. I like this idea of the European phenomenon. In fact, I was in Paris before coming here, and I went to an exhibition on the counterculture in France in the 1960s through the 1980s. And you know, one one uh, sign that was about call to violence and so on. It was very much. It was like kind of. It, to, to some extent, it was plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose for the European part of that. Of that, of that counterculture, if we want to call it. But, but I think you added the point about criminality, which I think is very helpful. 
Um, to Mubarak Ahmed's suggestion, I, I, I want to, you know, I, I want to embrace the grey zone as as you suggested, but I do caution policymakers that sh that policymakers should engage in Islamic ideological discussions. I want to caution against this because terrorism is a minority problem. When we start a public discourse about what Islam is and what it should be and what would be nice, nice, peaceful Islam, we would be creating a problem of a different order. Now, returning to IS's weakening ideological narrative that I mentioned earlier, it is unlikely to, to cause a fatal blow to the group, let alone its provinces. After all, and from a political science point of view, it's not as if IS has ever existed as a caliphate in the territorial sense of the word. Its territories in Iraq and Syria were not all contiguous, and its provinces, except for a small part in Libya, have not acquired real contiguous territories and delivered on governance. As many of the speakers at this conference have shown, the identities of these provinces are not inextricably linked to the territories held by IS in Iraq and Syria, and the survival of the Wilayat need not depend on the territorial survival of the core in Iraq and Syria. But they will face challenges. And what might these challenges be? Now, before I enumerate some of these challenges, let me now turn to what we do know and don't know about IS's decision-making to proclaim provinces. On this point, I think we know less than what we don't know. We know that the decision to proclaim a province is centralized, that a pledge of allegiance by itself does not make a, make a group a province. The provinces were officiated either by IS leaders themselves or through IS official publications. Some provinces are more equal than others as far as their output of violence. For example, the provinces of Sinai, West Africa, and Khorasan have surpassed their sister provinces in their output of violent operations. But... Not all violent operations seem to be equal in the eyes of IS. For example, um, we've had many operations carried out in the name of IS in different parts of the world. I'm thinking in terms of, among others, Somalia, Kenya, Indonesia, the Philippines, China, Bangladesh, and others. These did not lead to provinces. Why? Why didn't IS proclaim provinces in these countries? Some must surely be disappointed. Abu Warda Santoso, who led a small band of fighters in Indonesia's central Sulawesi, pledged allegiance to al-Baghdadi in late 2013. He was killed in 2016 and never got to have his pledge accepted. Mara Refkin remarked that the reasoning for declaring provinces ranged from resource endowments, I'm quoting her, access to smuggling networks, symbolic geostrategic location, proximity to rival groups. There may be additional considerations for IAS. It is possible that the group refrains from bestowing the title of, of a province on one group because it may be seen to be privileging some leaders over others and therefore creating divisions among groups within a region. Alternatively, it may want the different groups within a region to compete for the title and therefore causing them to mount large-scale operations to show their credentials and prove that they may be worthy of that title. But let's not always assume that IS's decisions are always calculated as if it is following the script of a master plan. Indeed, if we are to examine IS's proclamations of Wilayat closely, the political scientists would rightly point out that there may be a rather whimsical element in the group's decision-making regarding its Wilayat. The video that IS released last year entitled The Structure of the Caliphate and to which Ayman Tamimi and Mara Rafkin referred to yesterday, in that video, IS claims to have 35 provinces, 19 of which are in Iraq and Syria. The actual structure of these wilayat is shady at best. If a student were to come up with a structure of a caliphate like this, of a state like this, and would hand the paper for a political science 101, the student would receive an F. No doubt. It was interesting to note that of the wilayat the video described, three previously mentioned wilayat were missing from the count. Is this a math problem or something else? Interesting omissions of wilayat that I had seen before are Al-Sahel in Syria, Lahj in Yemen, and Bahrain, which is, I mean, it, it's a historical part between, between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Why and how these wilayat vanish, we don't know. But moving forward, what might be the challenges that the wilayat will face if the territorial core in Syria and Iraq is lost? It's 
So let me, I'm thinking now of possibilities. If they want to remain as provinces, there needs to be a caliph. Even the caliphate, even if the caliphate is not territorial, the, ca the caliph has to exist and he has to be traced to Quraysh. This, the Islamic State has, has made that clear. This would be fine if Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi survives. But if he doesn't, IS Shura Council, Council will not simply need to elect his replacement, but his replacement will need to appear in public. The main reason al-Baghdadi made a public appearance in the Nuri Mosque in July 2014 is because he had the legal obligation to do so. Muslims cannot be expected to pledge allegiance to someone whose existence is doubtful. I suspect that a successor for al-Baghdadi will have a serious security challenge making a public appearance. But it's not just how the core may affect the provinces that we should watch for. In time, the provinces themselves may, under, may, may undergo some power struggle from within. One important element is worth watching. Will any of the figures or groups that pledge allegiance to IS rescind its pledge? It was illuminating to listen to the panel about West Africa earlier. I suspect that the differences between Abu Bakr Shakao and Abu Mus'ab al-Barnawi may haunt IS core. Similarly, the offshoots of AQIM, Sah Sahrawi's group, may prove to be a liability to IS, as it was a liability for al murabitun the, the offshoot of AQIM. Another element to watch for, if and when some of these provinces enjoy success and acquire territories, will they want to promote themselves to a caliphate and oust IS? That is, after all, what Al-Qaeda in Iraq did in 2006 when it proclaimed itself the Islamic State of Iraq, the parent group of today's Islamic State. Eventually, it eclipsed Al-Qaeda. So let me now conclude with some lessons learned from Al-Qaeda. A number of speakers remarked that if it's not IS, it will be another group. This is very true. If political solutions are lacking, terrorism will flourish. But that's historical, there is nothing new. But as we continue to study terrorist groups, it is worth learning from the mistakes of the CT community, the ones that it made in its analysis of Al-Qaeda. It wasn't long ago when the CT community was obsessively Al-Qaeda-centric. And every group that shouted jihad or called itself Al-Qaeda was automatically presumed so and fell under either Al-Qaeda or its affiliate. You will recall the famous Al-Qaeda central description that the CT community used to describe the relationship between bin Laden and regional jihadi groups acting in Al-Qaeda's name. The documents captured in bin Laden's compound in Abu Tawad show otherwise. Ironically, bin Laden's letters make it clear that he was inspired by the expression Al-Qaeda central that he read about in the media and wished he could create such an entity to police the indiscriminate attacks of jihadi groups. In the letter to his associate Atiyadullah al-Libi, he writes, and I'm quoting bin Laden, this is expression, Al-Qaeda central, is a technical term used in the media to, dis to distinguish between Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Al-Qaeda in the rest of the regions. I do not object to using it initially to clarify the objective of the centralization endeavor. End of quotation. In other words, there was no Al-Qaeda central, and bin Laden would have loved to create one. I hope that current and future studies of jihadi groups will pay attention not just to what unite jihadi groups, but more importantly, what divides them. Let us then be discerning of the caliphate provinces model. It was never a coherent model, and let us not help IS by giving it a coherence that it lacks. Thank you. <laughs>